Hello, welcome to Life Beyond the Numbers, the podcast where we share stories, insights and strategies that go beyond some of the numbers we encounter in our work life. I'm Susan Lee Trevon. I work with organisations who put people first. I've lived and worked in many countries. I've met people who love what they do and people who don't. People who bring their full selves to work and people who won't. And together with my guests, we place a lens on and focus in on the people side of work life. Because we know that it is people who do the work, not numbers. And if we are treated well, we will perform well and might even generate better numbers. Today, I am absolutely delighted to be joined by Amantha King. Amantha, you are so welcome to Life Beyond the Numbers. Oh, thank you so much, Susan. Honestly, it's an absolute joy and pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Great. So I think many of us, me included, complain about the impact of social media on our lives. Wasting time scrolling, fed false information, polarizing opinions and so on. But the one thing that really is of benefit is you can find a community that can support you. You can accelerate lifting the silence on some topic that are often viewed as taboo. And it gives ordinary people like you and me, Amanta, a chance to voice what's happening in our lives. And one topic that really started to dominate my life about eight years ago is everywhere now, and rightly so. And I've been looking out for a while for the guest, the guest, to talk to me about menopause in the workplace. And I am so delighted, Amantha, that you are here to do that. And how I saw Amantha in the first place was on LinkedIn. And she had this fantastic post that started with, so Amantha, why is a young lady like you talking about the menopause? Over to you, Amantha. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. I I think you're right. I I love the fact that we talk about taboos more now than ever. You know, we're several generations on, aren't we? And particularly for women, you know, we're learning, we've got a voice and my golly, are we using it? So I started talking about menopause a year ago, um, actually coincided with World Menopause Day. And actually, ironically, I did something completely out of the blue. I did a video on YouTube and I was terrified. I just thought this, this could really damage my career, really damage my career. I've never spoken about this. And at that stage, I was 48, 49. And I just thought I have suffered, like really suffered. Suffering is such a strong word, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And because menopause is such an invisible at times condition, you do really suffer and it is a very very lonely place thank goodness for my husband to be there to support me but actually it is lonely you deal with it alone until you start talking about it and that's what became my purpose I'm a strengths coach I help people find the best in themselves and I just thought hang on a minute there's a bit of controversy here for me in order for me to be my best self, I need to tell people what's going on for me and just how much energy is required to cover up, show up, be this person for them. So that's why I decided to put that post out, Susan, which was, look, you know, I'm not your stereotypical. I've got grey hairs, but I don't think I'm the stereotypical woman that maybe I thought of as a teenager, you know, tights wrinkling down by her ankles, carrying a few shopping bags. You know, I mean, we, we could go on, but actually I consider myself to be a young woman. I love to look nice. I love to feel feel nice but I lost all of that in my 40s I became perimenopausal at 36 I'm still perimenopausal I still haven't been classified as menopausal yet so doing the math that's 14 years you ask anyone to suffer for 14 years and I think the empathy comes in waves from people so that's what I wanted to do I wanted to lift the lid on it it's not just me it's my friends it I want it for our daughters that's what I want it for more than anything so so to answer your question that's why I did it because it wasn't just about me I'm okay I could be better but I want my daughter to understand what could be on the horizon what she might need to think about in terms of her own fertility could her perimenopause come at 36 
So I want to empower young girls and and mothers. Let's talk to one another. Grandmothers getting on in the conversation as well. So so that was my motivation for doing it, which is to take away the stigma. Let's glamorize menopause, actually. Why you know, not? Why not? Everything else does. And there is proven evidence since the celebrities got on board. I'm an affiliate member of the British Menopause Society. They have actually done a study on awareness in menopause. And since Davina McCall did her uh, Channel 4 documentary, menopause has gone off the charts in the last year. It's crazy, isn't it? Because obviously this has been going on for time immemorial. And eight years ago, I was living in Switzerland. I was away from my family, my network. And to be perimenopausal at that point, I had no idea what was going on. And none of my friends were going through anything. And to find information was really hard, other than scientific documents, which are often way too bloody difficult to read. (laughs) And I found was a group called What Would Virginia Woolf Do? And this was a group on Facebook. And from that group, I got all this information. And the big thing for me was finding out, oh, thank God I'm not the only one. And starting to piece together the weird things that were all happening as being part of menopause or perimenopause, which maybe we could talk about some of the symptoms But before we do that, Amantha, maybe you would just talk us through the stages, because I think there is confusion about terminology often. Definitely. I know people can't see me, but I'm wearing a T-shirt that says Make Menopause Matter, the hashtag campaign. That in itself is, is fraught with problems because the terminology is all wrong. So let's talk about that. So when a woman is in her fertile years, that is pre-menopause. OK, so everything's rosy in the garden for most of us. However, there are one category of, of people that, that fit into this stage, which is the primary ovarian insufficiency. Now, this can be either due to surgical or something in your genetic makeup, but it just means your ovaries don't work. And so people as young as 14, there's a lady on Instagram who's 14 and she was she was shown on, on television as part of the, the government changes. So we need to open our awareness. This doesn't just happen to people like you and I. It can happen to people who are younger. So that would be the first category where menopause could show up. But actually, for most of us, it starts in perimenopause. Now, perimenopause is when your three hormones, we have estrogen, progesterone and testosterone. Ironically, although we hear a lot about estrogen, actually, it's the drop in progesterone that causes the most problems in these perimenopausal years. And what triggers it is actually that your ovaries are starting to deplete in the number of eggs sitting in them. We're born with a a certain number. Every time you have a period, an egg or two, because you could have twins, is released. And literally, it's an emptying vessel month on month on month. And some of us empty faster than others. We maybe didn't have a lot of eggs to start off with. Surgery can instantly remove all your eggs, in which case you go into what we call a surgical menopause. But with the perimenopause stage, so what happens is because we don't have as many eggs, our progesterone level starts dropping because progesterone is the hormone that maintains the lining of your uterus in potential readiness for a fetus. So then what happens is this negative feedback system starts working its magic, which is to go, "Mm, hang on a minute, we haven't got enough eggs. We don't need as much of that progesterone. So that starts dropping like a stone. And then our estrogen follows that. So really most, 75% of the symptoms, and there are over 45 that women can experience, are actually due to the progesterone dropping dramatically. But here's something else I want to throw into the mix. Throughout our lives, we have three times more testosterone in our body. Yet we don't hear so much in the media about testosterone. And yet it is being seen more and more in all the clinical studies that when women don't respond to HRT in the form of estrogen and progesterone, adding testosterone in is a game changer. And I'm testament to that. I take testosterone every single day. And again, when we think about the complexity in perimenopause, estrogen alone has over 400 functions in your body. It's mind blowing. It's mind blowing, isn't it? And and so progesterone equally 
has a vast array of functions, as, as does testosterone. This is more than hot flashes. This is about your cognitive function. This is about your brain health, your heart health. So all of that's going on in perimenopause. And we haven't even got to menopause yet. What happens then at, at a certain point when those hormones have really come down to rock bottom, what we notice is we haven't had a period for a whole year. Now, this happened to me last year. I got to day 364, Susan. I kid you not. I was like, get the champagne ready. I'm about to be menopausal. And I actually was really sad that day, really sad, because it's it signposting the end of fertility. I kid you not. On day 365, I got a period. Oh, my God. Can you imagine I the frustration, but also the elation, well, which was, OK, so I'm not quite there yet. So what happens is you have to go one whole year without a period before on day 365 you can then say okay I'm now menopausal on day 366 you are post-menopausal so this great big word menopause only happens for 24 hours so we've got to get that education right for people because if we're in business and we're just saying menopause well we've cut out the majority of people over the age of 35 to 51. So, so those are the key stages. Perimenopause, which is where the hormones are declining, symptoms are really turning up for you. And then you've got menopause, which is one day, and then postmenopause. Now, I don't want to burst anyone's bubble, but the symptoms don't go away. They change because what starts to happen is our bodies go, OK, I give in. We're, we're here. And then things like our bone health can start to decline, our heart health, our, our cognition. So we really, really must look at each stage independently, uniquely for the individual. And we really must be mindful not to put broad brush strokes over this. No two menopause experiences are the same. So I hope, I hope that helps, really. I, I would say to anyone listening to this, if you're 34 and over, you could be perimenopausal. And my favorite phrase, which I put in all my presentations, this is about joining the dots. Like you said, Susan, it's about connecting, hang on a minute, that headache that I keep having and those aches every time after I do exercise. It's about joining those dots and going to your GP armed with that information. So those would be the three key stages of menopause. Amazing, yeah, thank you for that overview. And I'm thinking back, because the other thing, I suppose, as, as you go through stuff, it's quite easy to forget how bad things were, which is, I mean, that's always, I think, a brilliant part of being human is that we can move on from the difficult parts and, and live normally in inverted commas again. And for me, the start with me was somewhere around 40 with periods going all over the place, like up and down weeks and months between them, days between them, just crazy feeling faint, bad sleeping, hot flushes, night sweats, all of this stuff. And then like you, Amanda, I got to 318 days and had a period <laughs> and that was it. And then I think I had two more and I was done. And that now is more than three years ago. And I found the day of menopause, my 12 months after a period, to be such an anti-climax. I was like, you mean this is it? <laughs> Where's the card? Like, you know, <laughs> I'm here and I haven't had children. So the fertility part didn't bother me. That wasn't something that I even thought about. I was kind of like, OK, great. But post-menopause? I did not expect the road that was ahead. And I had resisted HRT specifically because I thought, well, the dangers, I didn't read enough. And I thought it's too dangerous and so on. And we can talk a little bit about that maybe in a minute. But what happened then was the estrogen just kept lowering and lowering and lowering. And I guess the other hormones as well. And I became empty. Literally, that's how I felt. I started to feel empty. I was spending days in bed. It impacted everything in my life. And I think that's why I wanted to talk about it as well, because it wasn't just my life it was impacting. It was impacting the people I work with, impacting my partner, my family, my friends, because I was hiding myself away from the world. And it took me a while to realize that the bad days were outweighing the good. 
And I think because I was through it, through menopause, I thought, oh, I'm home free. Mm. And then I listened to this episode on an, a podcast called On My Last Eggs, which I think is the best name ever for a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> And they talked about the symptoms and that's where the pieces really fell into place, like allergies and things like that. And I connected those dots and I was like, OK, I need help. And this is where COVID didn't help because many of us were locked away as well, I think. So there's I, <laughs> there's so much in there. And obviously, we still want to to bring it out but maybe we talk about HRT first and I'd like to talk about COVID as well yeah actually. yeah, yeah. A- a- absolutely would it be all right just to list some of the symptoms oh, so brilliant. That we can, no, let's so we do could, that. So, that, so that so that people can start to join their own dots a little bit okay yeah that's so, great so th- they tend to, to fall into a number of areas psychological physical emotional but here's a catalogue of them so joint stiffness aches and pains Night sweats, low mood, anxiety and panic attacks, depression, fatigue, poor memory, trouble concentrating, like you said, irregular, heavy, light, inconsistent periods, chills, getting really cold at night, taking longer to recover from illness, exacerbation of existing conditions, vaginal dryness, weight gain, heart palpitations. I really suffered with those. So did I. Yeah. And those were so unnerving. Hair loss, hair thinning, that was me too. Yeah. Sleep problems, headaches, changing sex drive, dry mouth and skin. I was at the dentist more often than I was at my doctor for this burning mouth syndrome that I had. And the dizzy spells, like you say, there are more than 45. We've got to stop just saying hot flushes. Because that that really gets up my nose, actually. I know hot flushes do happen for people. But what we need to be aware of is that the symptoms will ebb and flow. And just as you get get control of one, something else will pop up. And one of the ones that I I think is so important that we talk about, because it does link to COVID, is histamine intolerance. So histamine, which is, for any of you that have allergies, like pollen allergies or pet fur allergies, you will know that when you pop a antihistamine, any rashes, sneezing, watery eyes goes. Now, we need to think about histamine and estrogen like twins, because they are. What happens to your histamine levels also happens to your estrogen levels. They go around together. They use the same metabolic pathways. Now, I know this. I'm a scientist. I've had two lots of genetic testing, both of which have confirmed to me that I am histamine intolerant, which is why when I did start taking HRT, I got worse. So you can imagine how that went down. I spent a fortune going to see one of the leading consultants. Louise Newson's actually my doctor. She's amazing. And I really rate her. She's got an 11,000 waiting list, I think, of people waiting to see her. But the bottom line was I actually got worse with my estrogen. Why? Because when you are histamine intolerant, you actually already have a lot of estrogen. So they call that estrogen dominance. So You've not got enough of the other two, but you've got tons of this estrogen, which drives all sorts of problems. You feel worse initially. So what I want people to understand is if you've suddenly become allergic to something, that's a light bulb moment. Make a note of it. One of the the key ones that you become allergic to is painkillers. I used to live on Nurofen, ibuprofen and, and aspirin. It was a cure all for me. I couldn't take it anymore. I get an extreme allergic reaction strawberries peppers anything that is a low lying fruit or vegetable will usually be loaded with histamine so there's a lot of research now that actually what menopause specialists do is they check where you are with your histamine so how does that link to covid we know that you have estrogen receptors in your ovaries all over your sex organs your bladder your lungs We know that COVID attaches itself to something called the ACE receptor site, and there's lots of that in our lungs. What we know is that through the research, women who are are menopausal, not taking HRT, are actually the group that have fared the worst with COVID, you know, in terms of hospital admissions, needing intensive care therapy. So we know there is a protective mechanism about estrogen, which is why women who are on HRT have fared a lot better if they have actually caught COVID. 
Now, what we also know is that for people who've had the vaccination or who have had COVID, it can really mess about with your symptoms. What we're seeing anecdotally, 17,000 women reported via a yellow card system to their doctors that they didn't feel great after the COVID vaccination. I myself had the worst menstrual cycle I've had in my entire life. I was in Scotland and without being too graphic, blood clots, which is what COVID is known to cause, blood clots after my vaccination, which meant I couldn't leave the house for three days, Jesus. not great when you're on holiday no. and it came out of nowhere so what we really must make women aware is if after you've had the covid vaccination and it's so important you do have the covid vaccination if you've noticed anything about the symptoms that we've just mentioned or anything else at all get an appointment with your doctor because what we do know is the vaccination and um covid itself can accelerate the onset of perimenopause so it's really important. Get yourself in front of the doctor. Get vaccinated because that's going to protect you anyway. But if you need HRT in the form of estrogen, that's going to doubly protect you. So it's a good thing. The research is really new. We're finding out a lot more about it. So I think that's why we have a lot more women going, yes, actually, I've connected a few of those dots. That is me. The only downside to this is we just don't have enough GPs who are specialists in it. So we need to go banging down some doors. And podcasts like this empower women to do that. So, so it's brilliant that we're doing this. I, I think that's it, Amantha. Like amazing information there, but it, it is about standing up for ourselves and figuring out what's going on and not just putting up. Because I think that's what I did. I was kind of like, oh, well, you know, it's just the menopause. It's just perimenopause. I just have to deal with it. Lots of justs in there. And you then slowly decline, perhaps, and don't notice how much you are declining. You know, yeah. I think that's what happened for me was it was gradual. And, and I had gotten through a lot of the other symptoms, but it was my energy that was now being just carved away. And, and like you said, palpitations as well, that was frightening. Mm. And that was what got me to go and seek help. And I actually volunteered for an NHS study Wow! because I felt that actually, you know, I always think of people coming after me and I thought, you know what, if if this HRT is dangerous, I might as well be part of a science study <laughs> that proves or disproves that. And so I volunteered for an NHS study that was low dose HRT and the impact on clotting. And I don't know what the results are. They'll be published next year. But I did that for six months. And now I've had my dose of HRT adjusted. But I started to get my life back in no yeah. time at all. And I'm not saying it's for everyone. I'm really not. You have to do what's right for you. But without asking the questions, speaking up and saying, you know what, this is crap. This really is crap. I don't have to live like this. Well, well, that's so true. I mean, if I said to you, this is a hormone depleted situation. This would be like saying to every diabetic or everyone who suffers from hypothyroidism, you can't have your hormones. There would be outrage and uproar. There would be demonstrated. We wouldn't stand for it. When my mum was going through uh, the menopause, she was told, well, you can take HRT for five years and then you're on your own. So, well, that's like saying to a diabetic, we'll give it to you for five years and then off you pop, see what you can do for yourself. Uh, it's, it's inconscionable that we would say that. Women need to be on HRT. So I would say to any woman, or a partner supporting a woman, it's not too late. You know, I was on um, a webinar with the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and with Louise Newson last week. And the message that was being drummed home was every woman deserves the right to a fulfilling life. And you just feel robbed. Well, this is not the age of suffering anymore. It's about putting that to one side and saying, right, because when we look at it, really, in the nuts and bolts of it, Susan, is we're losing the biggest demographic out of our workforce. So let's put the numbers on it. The numbers are that the average age for menopause is 51. 
okay? We know that the, the statistics are terrible. One in 50 uh, perimenopausal or menopausal women will be on long-term sick. So minimal contribution to the economy, minimal contribution to their own state pensions. It, it's not great. No one's winning. The fourth study showed that 63% of women were at work negatively having to deal with symptoms it's so shocking i've also got some other statistics here 41 percent said that their concentration and forgetfulness had led them to make mistakes so they were fearful of disciplinary 11 percent forwent the opportunity for a promotion we said before but this is the prime of our lives so if we've got children children are going off into their own futures so i've started a second business the menopause coaching since I, I've come into this life cycle for me, the third age, as they call it. If the average woman is menopausal at 51, she will have a life expectancy of 83 years. There's a lot of living to do, more than 30 years. There is a lot of living to do, absolutely. And there's a lot of contributing to the world to do. And you want to do that at full strength, not at half strength and not suffering in silence. And the workplace is, is a really interesting place to look because I think it's 13 million women in the UK, apparently, are perimenopausal or menopausal, and I guess postmenopausal as well. That's a lot of women. And that means a lot of teams, a lot of colleagues, a lot of bosses. And if people are dropping out of the workforce, it's not helping with women in leadership positions. And I saw something you posted about 59% of women take time off due to symptoms, 18% off for eight weeks or more, and 50% of them took early retirement or resigned. I mean, it's awful. It really is awful. An article I read that it was the British Occupational Health Research Foundation that 20% of women surveyed believe that menopause had a negative impact on their managers or colleagues' perceptions of their competence. And we all know perception is reality. Mm. So even if they're not seeing it like that, as a woman, you're feeling that and you're not checking. And instead, you're putting it in on yourself and building these stories and leaving the workforce or not going for promotions, like you said. And there's something wrong there. So what can employers and colleagues and partners do to help women? It's such a good question. I would have had to leave. If I was in mainstream employment, I would have had to leave. And I think it would come down to the stigma. The stigma. I mean, I can remember, you know, I had one of the symptoms I haven't mentioned is flooding. And flooding is when your hormones are so all over the place, you build up this very, very thick endometrium full of blood because you've got all that estrogen there. And because I'm estrogen dominant and then literally a small drop of your progesterone, it looks like there's been a bloodbath Jesus. in there. Yeah. And I couldn't leave the house for a week. Can you imagine how every, and my periods were coming every 18 days, by the way, and I was anemic. Can you imagine I was in a management role having to spend four days of the week in the car driving to be with my representatives? I would have had to leave because actually there was no solution. And my boss was a guy, lovely guy, but I wouldn't have dreamt of saying anything to him. So actually, I, that, I would not have been able to have stayed in that. And that's the decisions most women are making, because actually it's not just in our heads, but most people don't understand. I mean, the fact that we've even got to redefine what menopause is just shows how far we've got to go. So I think to answer your question, what can businesses do? It starts with knowledge for everyone, everyone, the awareness. I did an amazing webinar with a company last week and they were fantastic. Their response was exceptional. And do you know what? Maybe that's what we need to get going on, first of all, getting people to just be aware. Then what we do is we teach people how to have those conversations because most women do not disclose why they're taking days off work because they don't want people inappropriately putting two and two together and going, she's not committed 
no point trying to offer her the job. We we need to create a safe space, like psychologically safe for women to have this conversation to say, actually, yes, I am men- perimenopausal. You'll know that the government and various organisations are advocating. I think Timpsons was one of the organisations that said, we'll give people time off. I want that to be realistic, though. Do people think, well, we'll give you a couple of days or in people's cases like mine, can I have a couple of days every 16 days because my period is so horrific can I work at home I think we need to open it up so it's not just like tick box exercises which unfortunately is what mental health has become a bit like and so so what frustrates me and makes me very concerned is we don't go down that same line of let's just get some menopause first aid is in no when women have been surveyed they've actually said they do feel uncomfortable to talk to their manager so I think that's part of the solution but someone like myself I'm a menopause coach I can help women to have that conversation be impartial the company would get someone like myself in we'd arrange sessions for groups of women which is what I'm already doing and women's confidence grows massively massively because they feel empowered like okay that's making sense I know she's going to come back next month. I've got some things I can go off and do. I think that's how we keep women in the workplace. That's how we keep women feeling on top of their game. 51, which is not only the average age for menopause, it's also the average age for women to die by suicide. Yes, I've heard that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's lonely. And, you know, I both talked about loneliness. I mean, I don't think most people knew how much I was suffering. I was embarrassed more than anything else. Um, and I just thought it was me. And then I thought people would think, oh, God, she's really milking it. So it really was my husband. And I think I, I am connected with so many wonderful men who've talked to me very openly about menopause I'm an executive coach as well and I don't start a single session without talking about how's home how's family life and I can honestly tell you every male and female partner supporting a woman going through menopause said to me it's really hard so it's not just the women like you said brilliantly it's the people supporting those women and actually we need to take the awkwardness away from those managers and the way that we do that is we teach them because I feel for them if you've got a young guy and he's managing a team of women who probably are all perimenopausal actually that's a tough gig in a lot of ways I don't envy that person but we've got to move beyond that and the way we move beyond that is if we have education I do webinars for companies we make it fun enjoyable we have a laugh about it we normalize it we talk about it like we're talking about the football really we do we even say the word vagina and I've said it there you know so that's wow. that's, exactly, exactly so we just normalize it and actually the amount of people that came back and said that was so helpful but it is normal. That, yes. And that's the thing, isn't it? It is. It's part of life. It really is. And I know myself when, you know, I was in my like early 40s when the symptoms were dominating a bit and sleeplessness and everything. And I worked with a lot of women and most of them were younger than me. Yeah. And every opportunity I had, I was talking about menopause to them and they were shocked. And I even remember that 318 days for me or whatever and having a period I remember some of them being devastated for me as well because they knew I was going starting all over again with that 12 month countdown even on holidays I had a bunch of women and I was filling them in on (laughs) on symptoms and what to look out for and one thing that people laughed at me about and uh, I still would to this day think is very, very important is I kept records. I kept track of what was going on when. Finger stiffness, palpitations, sleepless nights, night sweats, all of these things, write them down. Keep a list because then when you go armed to the doctor and they tell you, what are you coming to me for menopause? And in fairness, some of them do that. And it's not all. You have evidence, you have data, and it's not memory because memory, as we all know, fades. Definitely. And that's so important. So important. And I was exactly the same. It was the only way I could have control over the situation, which was to document it. And like I said, being a sciencey sort of person, I thought I'm not going to get go to the doctors and for them to tell me to go away and keep a record. So you absolutely right there's a great app if I can recommend called the balance app that does all the note taking for you it'll even do a symptom checker for you and you can just take that to your doctor 
frustratingly, less than 5% of GPs prescribe HRT. It'll change, Amanda. It will change. change. So, so by us giving them the confidence, which is here's what the nice guidelines say, and I would encourage most women to print that off, go armed with that, take your balance app or your records that you've kept yourself. But, you know, Susan, the one thing I've learned, I've actually qualified as a menopause coach, okay? And um, the most important thing that I've learned outside of HRT is this. You can control your menopausal symptoms if you can control your stress levels. Stress is what actually accelerates your hormone decline. Mm. Cortisol, which is our stress hormone, is actually on the same pathway for production as estrogen, testosterone and progesterone. And we call it the pregnenolone steel. When you get stress, and here's the really amazing fact, when you get stressed, you release some cortisol, and that's helpful in the short term. Do you know it takes three days to get that cortisol out of your body? And that's yeah. why women going through the perimenopause are also most at risk of suffering burnout. I spoke to someone yesterday who was in burnout, but you become numb to everything. And so most of the symptoms, again, could be because we're stressed out. So I would really advocate some other things like meditation. The Calm app is brilliant, 10 minutes at a time. That just starts to reset your system. And again, when you're doing your note taking, you might actually notice, actually, if I've been doing a reasonable amount of meditation, things are a bit better. But hands down, we know the number one thing that improves menopause is actually women's awareness going into it. Definitely. It's like, any, it's like anything, isn't it? Like if you're going into a meeting unprepared, you don't feel great, do you? Totally. That's it. Absolutely. Awareness of everything. There's a great book called Estrogen Matters. And yes. I had no idea the impact that estrogen had on my life. And it's not the easiest book in the world to read, but it's worth going through it. And it really helps to kind of unpack what's going on for you and the impact on your bone, your brain and your heart. Just awareness by keeping data. Like I said, I actually brought a graph <laughs> of my periods to the gynecologist when I was in Switzerland she would, was happy to prescribe me HRT and I was like no I'm going to do this on my own yes. and so it's it's also take help I would say yes you know there's just that is so important I'm so happy that you reminded me of that because there is a lot of stigma about HRT means you failed and it really isn't. That's like saying to a diabetic, just because you can't get your blood sugar into your cells, you failed. No, this is a natural part of life. We're living longer. And do you know the reason that we stop having periods is very, very ingrained in our survival as a species. We become grandmothers. We become the elders. We become the knowledge base for the younger generation. So the fact that we're going to be living longer means that actually if if that is true and the survival of our species outside of climate change, what we need to do is actually be really, really clear about what's happening to us. And you, that can be incredibly empowering. And at 50, 14 years into my menopause journey, I feel more empowered now than I have at any other time. Yes, I know. Definitely. Like life gets better. Yes. And I, and I do as well. I mean, now that things are, I feel myself, that's what I feel. And I feel back to strength. I'm 48 and I'm still very young. That's the way yes. I look at it. If you're listening to this and you're in your 20s, you might not agree. But believe me, it, it goes by so fast. And I think the other thing about keeping data, Amantha, is to be able to have those discussions at work. If people are quick to dismiss, oh, well, it's just menopause and it's just symptoms, you could actually sit down and have a conversation with somebody about all the complexities that are going on in your life and the impact they're having. And for example, I went to a job interview. There was one person interviewing me and he was a lot older than me. But throughout this interview, I was getting hot flushes mm. every I would say like maybe every two to three minutes. So for an hour, I'm sitting there getting this complete heat wave up through very visible, but also it stops me in my tracks because yes. they were really, really, you know, hardcore. Now it had been going on for a couple of weeks. So it wasn't just the stress of the situation. And I'm quite relaxed in a way about things like that. 
But it's also what impact does that have on me? Maybe he thought I was embarrassed by his questions or I didn't know what I was talking about. And it's really interesting. So what would you say to somebody preparing for something stressful, perhaps like that? So from a menopausal point of view, I, I would say I am shameless in announcing it to people. I'm shameless. Anecdotally, people know I can't wait to tell people I'm perimenopausal. And so therefore, I need you to know that at any moment in time, I might be removing some layers. I bring the humour into it. And anyone who's in a workplace situation, the sorts of things I think I, I could direct people to think about is, you know, think about the candidate as a whole person you factor in all your knowledge don't you does this person have a family have they got elderly parents where do they live how far have they got to travel I think be more um, inclusive about the other information and factor that in so think about workplace temperature and ventilation think about access to washroom and bathroom facilities because actually one of the symptoms of perimenopause is urgency constantly feeling like you need to go to the loo and there's nothing that comes out type thing (laughs) access to cold drinking water you know just being that really patient and kind person saying are you okay you know just finding out how someone's journey's been. I can remember arriving at a really important interview and my Apple watch took me in the completely wrong direction. I was 10 minutes late and I arrived in a sweaty mess because it was cold in Devon when I got on the train. It was boiling in London. And I just remembered, Susan, it's the funniest thing ever. I was literally taking my trainers off to put my smart shoes on. And this voice said, are you Amantha King? Do you know what my answer was? I said, unfortunately, at this precise moment, yes, I am. <laughs> I couldn't have been more of a mess but I think humour is really if you can just embrace it and and make light of it if someone really is struggling access to a quiet breakout room and I think in workplaces I'm really passionate about this be flexible with things like uniform be flexible let's not have these back-to-back meetings for goodness sake mentally they're not good for our mental health and well-being anyway but let's have lots of breaks let's allow people to have their cameras off Let's allow people to be open enough that they can really be honest without fear of reprisal. I think that's the biggest thing. Honesty, trust, integrity. Channel 4 brought out a policy. I know a number of people who've implemented a policy at Santander. There really are going to be no excuses and it will become law. There are almost elements of the Equality Act that, that mean we have to pay more attention. But I think be human, Susan. That's what I'd say. Be human. Absolutely. Be human. And it's back to not making it a tick box exercise because no woman I've spoken to has had the same experiences I have. Yes, we've shared similar ones, but definitely mine was mine and unique. And what happened to me happened to me. And how I've dealt with it is how I've dealt with it. That's not the same for everyone. But the humour, Amantha, we're lucky enough to have a spare bedroom in our house. And we used to call it the menopause suite. (laughs) I love that because when it was too hot at night one of us would go in there because it was just too hot now we've renamed it the heat suite because uh, (laughs) because during the summertime it was so hot we needed to be in there anyway but I do think a sense of humor makes everything it normalizes stuff and it allows you to release those nerves or whatever that let you to talk about it and the thing is every woman on the planet goes through this these stages at some stage in their lives and many of them all of them are walking amongst you many of them in your workplaces alongside you your colleagues your friends and it doesn't mean they're any different than they were last week it just means they're suffering and they shouldn't do it alone well said susan Sorry, my mum is so box here. <laughs> I know, no, but me, me included, everything you said there just resonates with how I feel about it. I feel like, come on, you know, if we can do banter and have humour and, and tell funny stories, humour is an antidote to stress anyway. And I actually got that job that I went for. Did you? I never yeah. <laughs> It was hilarious. It was, yeah, I just thought, I oh, didn't. I thought, I thought I'd just get me, woolly, get me woolly coat and trainers and I'd just get back to Devon. And they rang the next day and they said, we loved you. We loved how natural and authentic you were. I said, did you mind the sweat? She said, no, that just added to your charm. And, and 
And, and I think that's it. We're wonderful people. We're the same people we were. You said that so well. We haven't changed. We actually just got better. And I want us to talk about it. I want us to really embrace it. If not for ourselves, let's do it. Every guy out there who has a daughter, a, a niece, a granddaughter, Sister. do it for them. Sisters, do it for them. And also let's talk about transgender people because transgender people will also experience menopause. If you've got hormones that are relevant to the menopause, you will experience them. So it's an inclusive topic. You know, we've got yet to discuss the andropause for men. But there must be something in that, too. So this is universal to all of us. It's a hormone depleted state. It's not a disease. It is a natural process. But if we're going to keep people working longer, keep people in our lives longer. And I really do mean that. Keep people flourishing, happy, fulfilled. We need to prick up our ears, roll up our sleeves and get stuck into this. And, and I think one thing, as you say that it. Obviously, you and I are happy to talk about this. We have no problem. And I hope anyone listening knows that. Not everyone does. And that's absolutely fine, too. And that's where society taking a change, it takes time. It takes time for people to open up. And I even noticed I went back to CrossFit for the first time in seven months. I met one, one woman was like, oh, Susan, I haven't seen you in months. Where were you? And I said, well, actually, I had to stop because of postmenopause symptoms just and I could see her bristle and I thought okay this lady doesn't want to go there so I I said a little more and that was it and also you know that's what I find is some people just they don't want to talk about it either they haven't experienced it they're still not open and I think be very mindful of that and if a woman is feeling a bit blah at work it also doesn't mean (laughs) It's menopause or postmenopause or perimenopause. That's the other thing. So tread carefully. Yeah, very, very much so. I mean, I've had client calls where people have said X over there, really hormonal, being difficult. And my throwback is, how do you know that? And I do think it's that. I, I, I think, you know, that openness and that honesty and transparency, if it's two way, you'll know if someone's menopausal. And it's about giving people the, the access to, like, as you say, to talk about it. I mean, I think social media gets a real bashing. OK, but I do think for those people who don't want to sit and have a conversation, social media can be brilliant. There's m- m- menopause, madness, midweek sort of 45 minute discussions you can put questions and things I think you find your crowd really the, what you feel comfortable with that might be a small knit group of girly friends that might be you know your mum it could be anyone but I think I think like lots of things there's lots of things that people don't want to talk about and you'll get a very clear sense like you did Susan of what's okay and what's not not to give up though at the first hurdle find people to talk to there are services like mine available we're happy not everything requires a paid consultation we put a lot of resources out there for people all my linkedin posts um and really instagram fo- and i think instagram. it's fantastic yeah. you know like check go after the hashtags like you said make menopause matter there's yes. so much menopause awareness month of october there was so much so you can search for hashtags yes it's everywhere and, and wasn't that wonderful i feel very proud to have been part of that movement because after a year of campaigning we now are going to save women thousands of pounds thousands of pounds that they would have either had to put themselves in debt for that is a triumph we that's just the beginning none of us are satisfied that it wasn't made free completely what i'm saying is though every drop of water that goes into this vessel in terms of our contribution either to seek more advice to give more advice to be that listening ear we owe it to ourselves and we owe it to generations coming to just keep talking and to talk with compassion, to talk with kindness, to talk with that open awareness and presence, which means that we don't judge people. Be the person that's not judgmental because it's hard enough being perimenopausal. You're judgmental enough on yourself. And I said to you this morning, Susan, I'm not great in the mornings. I don't often sleep well. I, I want people to see beyond the gloss. You know, I, I do look younger than 50. I know I do. But that then is a bit of a cross to bear because people don't understand how difficult it's been. I'm not shouting it from the rooftops. But you know what? Maybe when you ask me, how are you? Ask me again. And that's how I went for help in the first place. Somebody, the way they asked me how I was. Yeah. I knew 
that the answer I was going to give was not I'm fine. Right. And that opened up the floodgates, <laughs> literally. But it really helped because sometimes we do need someone from outside our inner circle as well to help us see we're not ourselves. Absolutely. And I think there's great power in that. There's great power in just having that time and space to show that kindness, because that's what we're really talking about here. Let's start with kindness and so much else will just naturally by proxy follow. So, yeah, I agree with you. Never ask once. I'm not suggesting you ask again immediately, but maybe leave a little bit of time and check in with people and notice how people are, because hormones change from second to second. You could be fine now and in 10 minutes it could feel catastrophic. Yeah, as a, <laughs> in Geneva, I used to go to a craniosacral therapist and he used to say to me, hormones are buggers. And, <laughs> and they really are. <laughs> so, Amantha, thank you so much for your time today. How can someone connect with you? Oh, my goodness. I'm everywhere. I'm everywhere and nowhere. So please connect with me on LinkedIn, um, Amantha King or Amantha Heaney, as I was known. I'm on Twitter at Amantha King. Amantha is such an unusual name. If you just plug in Amantha, you won't go far wrong. But at Amantha King Coaching on Instagram and at, at my Menno Coaching, which is the new part of my coaching business. Because I, after 20 years of coaching, men and women, I know that there's not a single time I haven't spoken about how they're partner is and how this affects them so yeah link with me there I'm in clubhouse as well for you those of you that are on clubhouse and I do lots of coaching conversations there about menopause and many other things so yeah just Amantha King you'll find me I know you will brilliant and I'll put some of those details in the show notes as well Amantha thank you so much for your openness your honesty your like sacrificing yourself and I think that's what people do is when you put yourself forward and say it as it is it makes it helps others. And hopefully, if you're still with us, you've learned something from this and you'll go out and make the most of menopause because menopause matters. Thank you for listening today. And if you enjoyed this episode, please share it with someone you know who would enjoy it too. I believe we are all entitled to enjoy our work. And the future of work life will be changed by those who put people first and create more fulfilling work lives for themselves, their colleagues, their teams and organisations. If you have any suggestions for topics you'd like to have covered, guests you'd like to hear from or questions for me, please drop a line to susan at beyond-thenumbers.com. And finally, please consider leaving a review.